Hilda and I both like to thank you guys for coming out. We really appreciate it. I know it was short notice. Um, I appreciate what Bill and Bruce from the Historical Society did. Uh, the, the purpose in, in Hilda coming back out here with me is we've both been able to visit trail marker trees in other locations that her father was actually at with Dr. Jansen, who did one of the most thorough studies on the trees. And Hilda knows that her father followed the trail marker trees, understood what they were. So for us, it's important to try to reconnect the family once again at the same trees that her father and Dr. Jansen would have been at. And uh, that obviously since he's from Michigan, since he's out of it. It's obviously that's the fact that her dad might have actually been by this tree with Dr. Jansen some 70 years ago. Hilda knows her dad came up here. Yeah, she came up here quite a lot in the, in the fall and in the spring with Dr. Jansen. He was, he was gone for two or three months when I was a little girl. And when he came back, I saw these pictures in the paper, and I asked him, you know, do you have older? I said, Dad, can you explain these to me? And he explained them to me then. All of a sudden, I saw this on TV, and that's when I met Dennis. You know, through television, and I saw the Native Americans he had on there, and I went, oh my gosh, it looks like my dad. And then when I connected with him, I told him I learned about these when I was a child growing up for my father. And then I told him I had pictures. A year later, I found the pictures. I actually, Hilda showed me photographs. One of the ones that isn't in the book is one of the ones on the easel. That tree's still alive. I knew where it was, so I didn't tell I didn't tell Hilda that I knew where the tree was. I asked her the next time that she came. I said I'm going to take that on a side trip, and we were actually able to go and put her where her father stood, and I got to stand where Dr. Johnson. That's 70 years ago. 73 so, years. And ago. another interesting thing that you'll notice with these trees. This is the same tree. This is from the front. This is from the back. They got planted around that. The lots have been divided now, but you'll notice the tree hasn't changed much in diameter. And what's nice in the book, you can see things that I've got hundred-year-old photographs of, where the trees were documented, and then current photographs, and there'll be an inch or two difference in the diameter. So this notion that they grow the same way is, is totally ridiculous. A hundred years ago, they knew they didn't grow that way. We know that now, and we can prove it now in a way they couldn't, because I've been able to prove it through photography. In other words, that can't change. This is the same tree, same address, same house. It's been documented now, not only with her father, but with scientists going back over 100 years. This is an example of a trail marker tree that would have stood near the tree in Highland Park. It was actually a, a row of 12 white oaks. This is just one of those 12 that led you from the shore of Lake Michigan out over into Highland Park through what's now called the Exmoor Country Club. It's a huge piece of property that was purchased right after the removal. So it, it was never logged, and right behind there was a Potawatomi village. And this uh, photo we don't have, there's a picture of her father with Dr. Jansen walking back to the village. So, when you got to the village, the trees continued to lead you off towards the chain of lakes and then onto Lake Geneva. So these were sub-trails off of the Green Bay Trail. Everybody knew that the American Indians knew the main routes. These were, the, these were a way of ex using exit signs, informational signs, mental markers. Any questions? Uh, most of these trees are all in the Midwest. No, they're through the Great Lakes system. Dr. Jansen went as far as New York in one direction, Texas in the other direction, Tennessee and Kentucky in the other direction, and up here. And that's only because his study was stopped after 13 years. He was relocated to the East Coast to take over the geological department of Marshall University. These trees have been documented all through the United States. Stones were obviously used, areas with mountains. It was easier to have reference points. My mother's people were from Idaho. It, it
it's a lot easier if you have a mountaintop there to go, okay, there's the mountain I know where I'm at. In our area where we live, where it's cloud cover, it's snow, you can't depend on the sun for direction. You can't, you can't see above the tree line. And this isn't the forest you would have been looking at in the old days. You have to go in the real wilderness where it's not cut down to understand how difficult it would be to navigate. You would need things to trip, your, trip triggers in your mind, not that they didn't know where they were going, but to make them aware, this is where I leave this trail to get this. This is where I go to get fresh water. This is where there's a mineral deposit. This is what I was taught by my grandfather. When you see that, that's where you leave the main trail. It's really ingenious. How old is the tree? Which tree? There's no way you can actually tell how old the tree is. I will not pour drill trail marker trees. I don't GPS them and I don't pour drill them. This tree based on a simple logger rule of six to seven inches per diameter of growth per year. You'd be sitting it if it was a normal tree in the 225 to 250 year range if it was straight. When the trees are bent, and this is about the main trunk. This is nothing more than a branch. So you reduce it, the movement of the liquids in the tree, and you're reducing it not to having a crown but one branch. It greatly reduces the growth rate of the tree. I also know that because I've grown the trumper. And I did a control group with a fir oak that was planted with 40 other fir oaks the same year. I learned that in science class. So that you can see the growth pattern, measure the other trees, and measure yours. Today, the normal diameter of those trees is about five and a half, six inches. The diameter of fir is about three and a half to four, period. And the density of them is incredible. From, from the, slow growth rate of it. I've had a couple that have died in the past and saved the roughness of it. It's, it's incredibly dense. So when someone tells you they know the exact date of the tree, basically they're, they're guessing. What's nice with things like this, where you have photographic evidence of a mature tree 75 years ago already with that diameter, it tells you that this tree is probably pushing 275 years, maybe 300 years. There's ones in uh, Indiana that are 52 inches in diameter. Two of them, identical, same species, same diameter, leading to an exposed copper deposit. And again, that's off the Tippecanoe River. That has been passed on from the American Indian community directly to the fur traders, directly to the pioneers of the settlers. That's something that all of us in the Great Lakes had a, a big advantage that we were living happily a lot of times with the American Indian communities and we learned this through intermarriage and it wasn't lost to our area of the Great Lakes. Helen Hornbach Tanner, I'm sure you historians know who she is, uh, probably one of the most well-respected historians on American Indian history in the Great Lakes area. Unfortunately, she passed away two years ago. I was able to meet her when I was younger, told her what I was doing, uh, she's actually, she actually did a quote for me in the book referring to her knowledge and the general knowledge of anyone who studied the American Indian culture in the Great Lakes would have to be aware of the trail marker trees. We're talking field research, not sitting at a computer and calling yourself a researcher. I've traveled over 250,000 miles doing this, over 30 years. I did not get a cell phone until two years ago because I wanted to do this study by actually meeting American Indians, historians, professors, arborists, archaeologists, anthropologists, going to the American Indian sites that are historically documented in all of our atlases for each state, and doing walks, looking for these trees and meeting people. And that's, you get a better feel for the need of these things, the use of them, and, you, and by meeting actual people of an, that had ancestry, people being involved with these things. People did care about it. People cared about a lot of things. Unfortunately, a lot of history was lost around World War II. Everyone's attitudes changed. Things got different. We built the highways. The main highways erased a lot of the remnants of the trail market systems. When you
you're going from a footpath like this to a cart path for a horse that's 12 or 16 feet wide. Then you're going to a 30 foot wide double lane car road. And when you get to the point where you're putting in an interstate on what were mainly the famous Indian trails, the amount of the trees that was lost was incredible. And you know, as I said, in our area in Illinois, and by the Channel Lakes, he said there were 75 of them between Lake Geneva and what we call the shore of Lake Michigan and the North Shore. And he said when the, when the main highways came in, it was just, there's nothing they could do to stop it. You know, you, you need highways, we all need highways. But that's what a lot of the younger people don't get. They, they, don't, they don't have the ability to, I grew up in an area where you can see these things. There were three separate rows of trees, one all red oak, 14 of them, one all elm, 11 of them, and the white oak trail was 12, they were all white oak. All separate trails leading to different things off of the main route of the Green Bay Trail that came around Lake Michigan. So when you can see these things and you grow up in that atmosphere, I just thought, what do you mean you don't know about the trail market trees? You know, when I was talking to other kids. And then that's when I started to realize it was more emphasizing the Great Lakes. Michigan had a lot to do with saving trees and information. Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Ohio. So it's a community up and working with uh, American Indian communities. Great. My aunt actually is Cherokee, 